news that's really great news. A 47% increase. I don't know if anybody else is doing that. But uh, that, that brings me, and I'll try to be brief. As the famous actress Elizabeth Taylor said to her six husband, I won't keep you long. <laughs> but there, there's a lot I'd like to say to you that I won't have time to get to, and I would love to hear you, your comments and, and questions. And I see microphones out there, so y'all be thinking as, uh, as I'm talking, because this is how we find out what's happening. And what I've discovered in reading and studying as much as I can over the years, and, and on that point, for, for those who uh, want to tell the children, remind them that a famous American, probably the most famous political figure that never was president, Jack Kemp, said, uh, told me that you got to read at least three hours a day to keep up. And I read the other day where Warren Buffett spends 80% 80, 80 of his time during the day reading. That's why he's a multi-billionaire, because he understands the way the world works. But this is, a, this is a great place, and my, my message to you is that there are a lot of challenges out there that we're facing. We have, have some in South Carolina ourselves, but I, I'm sure glad that we're the ones to face those challenges because the people of South Carolina have their own ways. We're a little bit different. Every state is a little bit different. And the man that said it the best recently was the chairman of DMW when they opened up the new expansion up in Spartanburg, in Greer, at the BMW plant that right now produces more BMW automobiles than any plant in the world belonging to BMW. We have a lot of those firsts and best in South Carolina that we often forget about. But he said that he's been around the world and he understands the different countries and he's been to many of the states in the United States. And he said, South Carolina is the only place I've ever been, the only state that I can call a handshake state. He says, that is the people of South Carolina, if they tell you they're gonna do a job, if they give you their word, if they shake your hand, say, I'm gonna come to work, I'm gonna learn, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be loyal to the company, I'm gonna be passionate about my job, and I'm gonna do a good job for you, he says, you can count on it. And he said, there's no place else like that. Now, you may have heard stories yourself about how visitors coming in, they tell me, people say that, they can tell when they get South Carolina without seeing a sign, without looking at the map. And that is because they'll go into, for example, a restaurant, and between getting their, uh, making their order and getting their bill, the waitress will call them honey, sweetie, darling, and dead, probably hug them on the way out the door. But we are a little different. We have a little different flavor. And I often wonder why that is. I, I'm a, a, a student of history. I try to read as much as I can. And I believe that we have a different history that is than, than the other states. We know, of course, those west of the Mississippi, the new states out there, didn't go through everything we went through. California didn't even start until 1849. We were, we were almost 200 years down the, down to, uh, yeah, no, 100 years down the road by then. But uh, starting in 1670, of course, when, we, when they first landed in Charlestown. But we've been through everything. We've come from different countries and different conditions, uh, from different places around the world, from Europe, from Africa, from other places now more recently. And we've been through, through all sorts of hardships, ups and downs over the years, and, and here we are. And we have a way about us that is, is different. And a lot of our friends from around the country, you may have heard them commenting after that tragedy at the Mother Emanuel Church, it, uh, they said that's uh, in the bond hearings when the victim's families were asking for forgiveness for, from the, for the young man who had murdered those people. He said uh, they were seeking, asking forgiveness for him. People called me and said they didn't know what it meant to be a Christian until they saw that. Things like that happen in South Carolina. Here and there over the years, things have happened, and it just makes this state different makes us stand out, and that is one of the reasons that these big companies who could go anywhere in the world are coming to South Carolina. They know we have strong, resilient people who take pride in the state, who love the state, who help each other, who are willing to work, and that's why all the big names are here. And at that BMW plant, ladies and gentlemen, it's hard to believe that they put the new BMW off the line every 61.7 seconds. Senator Campbell, 
and this, the expansion that they're doing now is going to be even more than that. And they're coming, I'm getting calls, the Department of Commerce is getting calls. It's just remarkable what's happening. So that's one reason that we need a great university like this one. We are uniquely situated to be the most prosperous area in the country. We had Arthur Laffer, y'all remember him, Dr. Laffer is the one who taught Reaganomics to Reagan. We had him at the, uh, in Columbia the other day with a, a lecture for folks. And he was commenting in his travels around the world and around the country, he says this is just wonderful in the United States. You have all these states, all of them can experiment the way they want to. They make their own rules, they have their own agendas as, as far as economic growth and development, trying to attract businesses and get businesses to expand. He said it's wonderful to have that kind of competition in 50 different places and it doesn't exist anywhere else in the world. And that's why we have such great opportunity. And in South Carolina, with the assets that we have, no other state has the assets that we have that are so directly in favor of great economic growth and development, which means stronger and stronger people. So the one thing that I've determined is that the way to stop that expansion and to put the brakes on it is to have taxes that are too high, as Dr. Laffer explained in great detail with, with uh, great truth, or have too many regulations. And so that's why I'm doing this tour. And I invite you all, if uh, you know or you have a, an opinion of a rule, a regulation, a tax, a fee, or anything that the government is controlling that is a hindrance to the development of good business, let me know. Uh, some people suggest things when we have these meetings like this, but I encourage people to call, to write, particularly write, it takes a little, little more precision when you have to write it down. But send it to us, because we want to eliminate the obstacles that are keeping us from growing. Senator Nicholson, by the way, I watched these two men in the Senate for a long time, and they both do a real good job. I think y'all can be very proud of it. Now, here are the, the advantages that we have, just very quickly before, before we open it up. One is we've got great colleges all over, all over the state. They're different flavors, they're different, different types, colleges and universities, and we, we have something that is a, a great asset in that our young people can go to college, can go to a university, they can get a four-year degree if that's what we want. And of those colleges and universities, three of them are major research universities that are recognized all across the country and other parts of the world. That's in USC, USC, and Clemson. And there are all sorts of public-private partnerships that those schools are entering into with Boeing and other companies where the, those companies are paying money. Siemens just gave state-of-the-art engineering technological software to the University of South Carolina worth, I think, is $628 million. Now, that's, that doesn't just happen. They don't give that to just any organization. But the University of South Carolina has been partnering with businesses, and when these businesses, representatives come to, to my office to talk about the options in South Carolina, one thing I tell them is the same thing I'm telling you. We have these three research universities, and they're located in different parts of the state. If you want to locate anywhere, you can enter into a partnership with them, and you essentially have an entire research department right there at your disposal, where the young, brilliant minds can work with the older, experienced people in an actual manufacturing setting, business setting, and it benefits everybody, and it's happening. Other states don't do that. What else do we have? We have the finest technical college system in the whole world, started in 1961. Uh, I noticed that the Technical College, Piedmont Tech, is a sponsor here. I'm just looking at this. Here you have Lander University, Piedmont Technical College, and Self Regional Healthcare, the, the hospital, where I think all four of Strom Thurmond's children were born, if I remember correctly. You don't usually don't have institutions like that, as well as businesses and others, in one place like this. That's why 
itself. That's why these businesses are growing. That's why Piedmont Tech is so strong because this is a, that's all you need for great prosperity. But our technical college system started in 1961. Fritz Hollings was governor, later being senator. He asked a man named Stan Smith, who lives in Columbia, if, if he would set it up. Stan Smith had just come back from the war, and they did. And they started that technical college system. Ours is the best, it's matured. We have a part portion of it called Red ESC. What is that? You can ask the Germans about it. They'll tell you we've got 160 German companies in South Carolina right now. 120 British companies. I didn't know that until two days ago when the British consul paid a, paid a visit on us. So I was not aware of that. But <clears throat> what the, these Ready SC does is, and we're unique in the country with this, if there's a business in Germany or France or China or any place else that is interested in coming to South Carolina and they are big and they can they, they can do what they say they're going to do and they'll establish a manufacturing plant or some other sort of business like that and they're willing to hire our people and treat them right and pay them right. If they're willing to do that, we will send to their country a team of people from, that are based in a technical college system that will go study their manufacturing plant find out how the machines work, find out how you make the machines, see if they have robots or if they don't, and then they will come back to one of our technical schools and design a curriculum calculated and designed to produce the kind of workers that they need to do their work, all at zero charge to that company. Now that is an enormous advantage. Nobody else has that, and that's one reason they come in here. So we have the major research universities, the colleges and universities, technical college system, a couple other things quickly. The Port of Charleston is getting deeper. We're going to 52 feet at mean low tide. We've got the money. Dredging is going to start in October. It wasn't easy getting there. We had to get the White House involved at the last minute. Senator Lindsey Graham went to work and worked hard with the Army Corps of Engineers. They finally put it in the Army Corps' budget without that happening, it, it wouldn't have happened. But we got it in the budget. Senator Hugh Leatherman, you all remember him, led the effort years ago to see that we put, put $300 million aside so we would have the money if the federal government didn't have it. And guess what? The federal government didn't have it, but we had it already set aside. So we're ready to go starting in October. And when we get through, we'll have, we will be able to handle those big post behind the back ships. You all will see them. They can carry 13, 14,000 of those trailer units that you see on the highway. It's unbelievable how big they are. They'll be able to come in two at a time, day and night, 24 hours a day. And we in New York, New Jersey, will be the majority of the, the major ports on the Atlantic coast in about 15 years. What else? Well, years ago, our people thought it'd be good to buy some land up around Greer just in case we wanted to have what is known as an inland port. That is the railroad line north of southern runs from Charleston all the way all over the country but goes across 80, 85 at Grill, you know, Interstate 85. So we had the land, BMW moved in, we created an inland port, which is a warehouses and a side track and all that. So what that means is a, a tractor trailer coming north or south and come to Greer and instead of having to drive it 200 miles down to the port and then come back all the way to 85, a total of 400 miles and put the load right there, it goes on the train and effortlessly goes down to Charleston. Same thing going in the other direction. About three months ago we broke ground in Dillon County on I-95 where the CSX rail line goes. Got competing rail lines going to Charleston. Now we're going to have two inland ports. That one crosses 95 and do the same thing. How do you spell port? M O N E Y. That's how you spell port. And it's producing it, and everybody knows it. And these countries that are coming here that rely on imports or exports know it, and that's something else that we've got. We have a right to work law. They're all looking for that. Some other states are, are enacting those now. But we have a right to work attitude, too, which is equally important. What else do we have? We have the mountains on one end, we have the oceans on the others. My friends in Kansas and Nebraska, I tell them, I'm sorry, boys, you're not going to ever have an ocean. Nothing you can do about it. You may have had one 50 million years ago. It'll be another 50 million before you get it back. But we got it now and we're using it. And also the mountains. 
In our state, you can be in the beautiful white sands in Myrtle Beach or Pauley's Island or Hilton Head, get in your car and, and way before sundown, just about lunchtime, you can be up in the, in the Blue Ridge uh, sipping some coffee and getting ready to watch the sun go. They can't do that anywhere. But the main thing they all have told me in the last few years is the people. They say it's the people that make the difference. The institutions, the buildings, all of that, the infrastructure, the ceremony, all of that makes a big difference. But you can't do any of that, and we wouldn't have any of that without the people. And that's something that has taken a long time, as I mentioned, to develop over the history of this state. But that's where we are. We're in a great, great shape. And so to, if I can quote Christy Todd Whitman, who was the governor of New Jersey for eight years and then was the head of the EPA for several years under President Bush, uh, we were at a, a meeting a few years ago in Columbia in a tall building that was in the capital city club. Some of you have been there, you know, they had the big windows and you can look out and you can see the Congaree River and you have the Broad and Saluda and you can also see all the green out there and look down on the university, look down on the state house, which by the way is a beautiful, beautiful building. So is the governor's mansion. You ought to see that. You know, some people spend a lot of time doing some good things here in South Carolina. But we were looking out over that and I was talking about the assets we had and told her that I think we, we really set for great prosperity. And she said, yes, I believe you are. I hope you don't mess it up. <laughs> so that's our job, is not to mess it up. There's not another state that can compete with our state. There's not another group of people that can compete with our people. What we have to do is to get the obstacles out the way. We got to educate the children. We got to keep the place clean. We got to keep law and order. We got to keep people safe. We'll have to let people keep their own money and we have to get the government we must have government to maintain those things, but we have to be sure that we're not enacting rules, regulations, and tax structures that hinder government. And that's why I'm here, other than I love to come to Greenwood, because it is a beautiful place to be. So that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. And I'd be happy, I'm honored to be here, and I'd be happy to, to hear any questions, suggestions, or answer any questions that I can in the time that, that we have. Thank you very much. Exchanges. We've got about 200,000 people in South Carolina who rely on those exchanges. 
Um, I'm state issued, but what's happened is we're down now to one Blue Cross Blue Shield is the only provider in the state. They just proposed a 33.4, 33.5% increase for 2018, which will jump all those premiums up for those 200,000 people. A lot of those people won't be able to afford that. So what happens is when they get sick, they go to the emergency rooms at hospitals across the state. And uh, that's a hard thing to ask you what to do, but uh, I just want to know what your thoughts are. Well, there, there are a lot of pro uh, proposals, but the, it was predicted that the Affordable Care Act was not going to work when it, when it was enacted. In fact, I and 12 other attorneys general in February of 2010 filed the Obamacare, we call it, lawsuit. And as you recall, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that the Commerce Clause of the U.S. Constitution would not support that law, but that the, uh, the income tax provision that amendment to the Constitution would allow it. Everyone I know who reads very much law <clears throat> thought that was a, a, uh, a poor decision. Uh, I, th I think that the, the farther you get away from the U.S. Constitution and its provisions, I think it's a miraculous document. Uh, it, it, it has stood the test of time and has made us allow this country to become what it is. Anytime you run afoul of that Constitution, you're playing with fire. I think that clearly was a violation of the Commerce Clause, uh, which says that the U.S. government uh, cannot, uh, can regulate interstate commerce, but nothing else. Well, tell, him, uh, tell himself uh, Nicholson that he must buy health insurance is, is far outside of the scope of, of the Commerce Clause, we thought, but the court, the court disagreed with it. So the answer is what to do. I think that uh, we have to get free enterprise back into the system in some way. I think that's the only thing that holds down prices. It's been clear the, the Obamacare uh, or the Affordable Care Act was designed, we had all sorts of things to hold down prices and all that. Those things don't ever work because there's always some other way to, to get around it or, or some of the unintended consequence. But here, what I'm committed to is taking health care as far out to the individual as we can. Were, I met with a group in Spartanburg just uh, last week, and they are uh, dedicated to telemedicine, and they, there's a company that wants to build kiosks, like a big phone booth, but they have a blood pressure cuff and uh, a stethoscope type of thing. It's, it's not a stethoscope, but you pull it out and stick it on your chest, and all that, and you can go in to a grocery store or the of the health clinic or wherever they happen to set them up. And you can connect with the, with the hospital instead of having to uh, have to drive to the hospital or certainly to the emergency room. Uh, that's a good idea. Telemedicine in itself is a good idea. Where, and the idea behind a lot of this is where well, you can do it with your smartphone. Because if you have a, something wrong with your hand, you can, you can call up and, and show them your hand and you'll have a nurse or a doctor that can tell you something. Of course, all the serious things, and somebody's gonna have to go to the doctor, but there's a lot we can do in the beginning to prevent things and nip them in the bud that would save a lot of time, enable a lot of people to get medical and uh, health attention and, and save a lot of money. And that's just, just one idea. Uh, I'd like for, for veterans to have a credit card they could use anywhere to go, instead of having to always go to the VA hospital, which may be 200 miles away. Newt Gingrich proposed that, I think, about 10 years ago. It hadn't caught on yet, but I think now that we've gone through this experience, that might happen. But primary care health clinics, we've got to get the health care out to the rural areas where the, where the people can't get to the doctor. And um, some of the doctors have expressed some worry about being cut out of the picture, but I think there's going to be more and more room for, for particularly for specialties and things that uh, we will always need more doctors and more nurses. We have a shortage of nurses right now. So I don't know what the answer is, but, but th those are the things that, uh, that guide me. But I'm confident that 
that there are ways, this is another instance I think of the federal government with rules of having these unintended consequences and they don't go again. But uh, I bet you that, I bet that, that, that we can come up with, with answers, some of which have been suggested by the people I've been talking to that will make it work. Yes, sir. But let me, let me say, any ideas that anybody, any of you have on any of this that you uh, feel strongly about, let me know. I have learned over the years that politics, the essence of politics is looking for the next good idea, a bunch of ideas. So just keep them coming, and uh, they may be the ones that, that change everything. Another question, or comment. Yes, ma'am. I'm Sarah Floyd. I'm with Representative McCravey. He is the founder of McCravey Newlands Turkey Law Firm here in Greenwood. That would be John McCravey. I've yes, known sir. him 20 years at least. Really? I'm sure there's other small business owners here in the room, and McCravey Newlands Turkey pays 59% of their profits every year in taxes, and I get the impression that that is not an outrageous number for small business taxes. So what can we do in South Carolina to bring that number down so we can put that money back into the economy? Uh, you, are you speaking of income taxes? Yes, sir, state yeah. taxes. State, okay. Well, you have the sales tax, you have the uh, income tax, of course you have uh, the federal death tax is really a, an abomination. We need to get rid of that. But uh, I'll tell you what Arthur Laffer uh, pointed out, uh, I mentioned him a few moments ago, Dr. Laffer, by the way, he did a study, it's in his recent book about the, it, was a t it had the same title as Adam Smith's book about the, the creation and something of the wealth of nations. Well, this was the creation and something of the wealth of states. And in it, he goes through an exhaustive analysis of taxes among the states. And he uses as his focal point about 10 or 11 states that have enacted income taxes since 1960. That is, they had no income tax before, but have enacted them since 1960. And 10 or 11 states that do not have income taxes. Of course, you have sales taxes and others and fees. But it is remarkable to see, to compare those two groups of states and see how the ones without the income tax have gone up in wealth, creation of wealth, and how the others have gone down. And in your experience, I imagine people here have been to Detroit, and you've been to Cleveland, and places like that, and you've seen what's happened there. Uh, in Cleveland, Ohio, the population in the 70s was, I think, around 900,000. Well, now it's something like 381,000. Everybody's leaving. High taxes. Uh, the same thing in Detroit, except it's worse. But you know where they come in, they, they come in here. And our taxes, I think, can be can go down. I think our taxes need to be down. But I believe that if you lower taxes on people and businesses, that they have more money to invest, which they will do. They will open businesses, create products, and buy things and do something. <clears throat> Arthur Laffer calls that the supply side. You, you increase the supply of goods for people to buy, and they will buy the goods, and that's how you get the economy going. The demand side, which he does not think works, and I don't think works, is you just give some people some money, and they will create the demand, and they will buy things, and that will cause businesses to thrive. I think that model has not worked, because to do that, you have to tax the people higher to begin with, and that's what these, that's what all the Laffer's books and others are showing doesn't work. So I'm with you, uh, and we are looking for tax reform. Where'd that lady go? We're looking for tax reform. Uh, if you if tell Mr. McCray to write me a letter and put that in there, and we'll, we'll uh, include that in the exhibit when it comes time to, to make the argument. But um, the lower tax, you have to have a certain amount of money to run the government. You just have to. There are a lot of things that need to be done, including building roads and bridges and having schools and all of that, police protection. But 
But once it gets up to a certain point, you start reaching the diminishing returns. And we've got to find that, that point. Now what they, they tell us uh, is we are a little bit high for where we ought to be. We ought to go a little bit lower on, on our taxes, income and otherwise. I mean, a lot of, a lot of folks, I, I, would, I would like to see the numbers on what happened if we eliminated the state income tax. I'd like to see that how, how that would be projected to work because we'd probably have to raise the sales tax. And that, that uh, has complications like that. But anyway, I hope I've answered your question. Send us some recommendations. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to have you here, sir. My name is May Gallon Wall, and I have the honor of serving as chair of the Greenwood County Community Foundation. One of the points that you highlighted um, very effectively in your speech was what we have here in the state of South Carolina with post-secondary education. The statistics here at Lander with the surge in freshman en enrollment is clearly the direction we need to see, not only in Greenwood, but across this great state. What we do know from research is that the trajectory for a student to be ready for college and to be on that path to be college ready begins not only in elementary school, but in early childhood education. Currently in Greenwood, we have over 50% of students receiving pre, uh, free or reduced lunches. And as we all are aware, that is an indicator of poverty. My question to you, sir, is what is happening at the state level to eradicate some of the barriers in education and also channel more resources towards early childhood education so we can have a more trainable pipeline of students that are college ready. Good, good question, and, and you're right, and learning starts early, and we do have <clears throat> uh, homes uh, you know, where uh, a lot of children come from that, of course, are not, not ready, no doubt about that. And I think we need to concentrate uh, on that early uh, preschool education we have Governor Haley started a number of new ideas. I think are good. We're working on some. I think we need to have more investment there. But I think the, the big answer, the long-term answer to that situation is, is economic growth. Because I know this from my own experience. If someone, when you have jobs, when you have people that get up in the morning and they have a job that they want to do and they get paid for, Enjoy it, especially when that starts happening, when you have economic growth, a lot of these indicators associated with poverty and discontent diminish. And they, those are such things as domestic violence, when poverty goes up, when hard times come in, it goes up. When, the, when economic growth is taking place and people are working, it goes down. Drug usage, same thing. Marriages go up, divorces go down when you have economic growth and prosperity. The main cure to most of our problems, if not 100% of them, and not 100% of those problems we have, is economic growth, which is reflected by good jobs that people enjoy and they get, they get good pay for. So how do we get there? Part of that is, as you mentioned, is in our colleges and universities. And that's why I'm glad that we have plenty of them, because that means that plenty of people will be able to, to go and be accessible. But there's something that's happened in the last 30 years, I'm glad you brought this up. Something's happened in the last 30 years that a lot of folks have not caught up with. And that is there's a new kind of job out there now. And these manufacturing plants, the ones I've been in in the last few years, maybe you've been in them too, there's no grease on the floor. They got they're, they're no toolboxes. People are walking around with laptops. They don't have toolboxes in there anymore. Everything is computerized, and you have people that are making fifty-five, seventy-five, eighty-five thousand dollars in those plants. They're good. They clean jobs. It takes training. It takes skill. Uh, here's a story. Just just one of many. 
about the young man who was down on his luck. He was essentially a, a street person, and somebody took him under his wing and took him in and uh, got him to get his GED, his equivalency degree, high school. <clears throat> With that, they talked him into going to the technical college where he signed up to become a welding student. And you take a lot of courses, but you concentrate on that. And he got a, weld, a two year associate degree in welding. And you ought to see the list of specialties in these degrees you can get in a technical college system. It's phenomenal. And, and most of them are, are, are they high tech and so quite something. Anyway, he got his welding certificate or associate degree and went out and welded in some company for about six months and decided he wanted to be a nuclear welder. So he came back and got that certificate in some period of time and went out and he was snapped up and making uh, immediately somewhere over, somewhere between $100,000 and $125,000. That happened, that's happening all over the place. In fact, right now, According to the information we have, we got 60,000 jobs out there for carpenters, truck drivers. We have long distance truck drivers making $100,000 a year. They don't load the truck, they don't fix the truck, they drive the truck, which might be worth a couple million dollars itself with all the equipment and stuff that they have in there. They're making $100,000. Electricians, welders, all that, we're short. This is probably the first time in the history of our state where we, we have more jobs than we have people. We got these companies are looking for people. And all of these big businesses, these big manufacturers that I've been referring to, they're starting apprenticeship programs. Uh, the the German, Germans have probably the best in the world. We're trying to learn what we can to improve our apprenticeship programs that we've had for a number of years. But bring in an apprentice, they can, they can work, they can go to tech and they can work as an apprentice in, in that company and get paid for it. And if, if the uh, program is, has been approved by the U.S. Department of Labor, then the uh, company gets $1,000 each year of tax credit for having that apprentice for, I think, the maximum is four years. And uh, Secretary Acosta said the other day, I was talking to him in Washington, they want to send that authority of authorizing those apprenticeship programs back to each state. So we don't, we don't have the delay of having to send the information up there and them send it back and all that. We, we can do it ourselves. But though it's a whole new world out there in those jobs. And unfortunately, a lot of our citizens have not caught up to the fact that it's, it's, not, your, it's not your daddy's or your, your granddaddy's trade job anymore. It's a different world. And they're a good job. We got 22 year olds getting out with these associate degrees buying houses. Isn't that something? And uh, we in South Carolina, as I mentioned, we have the best system for producing those people, anybody in the country. But we've got to get those students to understand that's the way it is. They can go and get a two year associate degree, and most of those credits will transfer from, not, not from all of the technical colleges, but from, I think, from most of them. If they decide they want to do a distance learning thing on the computer, you know, online later on, they could get that four-year degree if they want to. But everybody doesn't agree, uh, with all respect to this fine university here, everybody doesn't need a four-year degree in liberal arts. They just, uh, they, don't, they don't need that to get a good job today. And we have ample opportunity to capitalize. I'm so glad you brought that question. I'm talking too much. I, anybody have a, another question? I'll keep talking as long as you have a question. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. My name is Chuck Boats. I serve on the Greenwood County Council. As you might expect, I think the government that is closest to the people, local government, is the most effective. I have a question about the local government fund. We were down at Hilton Head a couple of weeks ago. We were told by our state legislators that the snowball's chance in hell of having a local government fund funded to its full statutory limit. And I'd like to know what your position is on that and if local government can expect any help from you with regard to this fund. Uh, the answer is yes. And the problem is that we are not funding a lot of things to the extent we're supposed to, including uh, education. The law says we're supposed to do one thing and, and we don't have the money to do it. So the, so the question is, where do you get the money? And 
and the way it, that answer we're going back to it again is economic development. That's that is the only way to get the money because our money blanket is not as big as our money bed. We cannot fund all the programs that we have with the money that we have to come in. And it is always a fight. As these members of the legislature will tell you, um, people come in, they have a great program, they have a great uh, need, great need, and there just is not enough money to do it all. So uh, that's what happens. But the only way to, to see that these programs are fully funded is to be sure that, they, that they're all, all worthy. That's another thing I want to do is take a look at the boards and commissions and, and just see if we need all of those or, or whether they, they don't cost much money, but they do cost some. See if we need to streamline that so we streamline the agency some. But the only way, the only realistic way to make what you're talking about happen is to have a growing economy. Any more questions? Well, ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you very much for inviting me. And it's a pleasure to see the president of the college again. I know you're doing well and keep it up. And uh, anytime you invite me, I'll try to come. And I want to invite everybody here. Anytime you're in Columbia and you have time, let us know. We can come to the State House and take a look at it. You'll love it. And give us a little notice and we'll get you through the mansion and let you take a look at that. It belongs to you and you ought to know what it looks like. Thank you very much.